Well, with me is Chris Robert Shaw. We're talking about the Dr. Ranson DHSC, the latest appeal taking place. Uh, okay, we're a few days out. I've been away, but I've been following it. Uh, I wasn't there for any of this, so I'm in your hands, Chris, completely. Um, but up to now, it's been quite uh, interesting, jaw-dropping stuff sometimes even. Um, what happened on this occasion? And let's just say that uh, Dr. Ranson, again, their side won this. The DHSC appeal was rejected, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah, again. Right. Uh, the first, the first appeal. I remember, uh, Laurie Hooper said, "Oh well, you know, it'll all come out in the appeal." And of course, within uh, very short shrift, it was received um, uh, by the appeal on the part of First Deemster, who gave a verbal ruling literally a few hours after the closure of the first appeal. Um, so the second appeal, I think you remember um, before it actually took place, it was actually delayed once, do you remember? Mm. And I said to you at the time, when we were discussing, I said, well, I'm not surprised, there's, there's no body to this appeal at all. I mean, I thought they'd seen sense and decided, well, we'll, we'll withdraw it. And uh, you went away and, and uh, I, I was astonished to find that actually it had just been postponed for some reason or other. So, what was it, you know, the actual nuts and bolts of this appeal, this one? This, this, this appeal uh, was, was about um, a legal um, and professional privilege um, relate, as it related to uh, Anna Healy. The argument, the, 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 the essence of the appeal was simply that, well, in fact, um, she shouldn't be called back because she had, uh, there was no right, the tribunal had no right to, to transcend uh, le legal and professional privilege, which is right. But the point is, the astonishing thing is that uh, a significant number of weeks beforehand, um, the tribunal had, had, had gone to a, a significant amount of trouble to make it absolutely clear that there was no intention for that to be um, in any way in, interfered with. We should point uh, out Anna Healy, AG's department, mm -hmm. representing the government, when we were watching this initially play in, out. In the first pl yes, in the first yes. place, in the actual tribunal itself. So um, the astonishing thing was that, that uh, the appeal still went forward and right at the beginning of the appeal, the uh, advocate representing uh, the the other side, as it were, said, "Well, uh, we accept the fact that there is there is going to be no um, challenge on legal and professional privilege." Um, it was almost as if, but we've thought of something else, and and uh, th they came out with this sort of rather convoluted idea that that, that somehow the tribunal had erred in um, in law in some shape or form. But what was most astonishing about the appeal, effectively, was that we heard from both sides, from both advocates, that they hadn't got a clue why they were there. I mean, that's both. Just, sides. Uh, yeah. well, hang on, I mean, DHSC were pushing this, right? So they must have had you know, the upper hand on this one. They they were going to appeal no, it. No, I mean, they they appealed it. They started off by saying, "Well, there are no grounds for the actual appeal." Oh, but by the way we've come up with this and well you know from the, the judgment that didn't didn't wash with uh, the first deemster as the first appeal didn't didn't wash um, you ha I think it should be said at this stage as well that the two uh, ministers the first the f uh, Laurie on the first appeal and, and Rob on the second you remember Laurie I'm repeating myself here very quickly mm. said oh well it'll all come out in the appeal well nothing came out did it at all and then Rob took the view, as, um, as we were running up to the appeal, that there was a vital point that needed to be dealt with in the appeal. And of course, myself, along with many other people, just wondered what that vital point was. And, and we were to find there wasn't one. So who was it that, that was advising the, the minister of the time, Laurie, on the first appeal and the subsequent minister, uh, Rob, Collister in the second appeal because that frankly they were talking nonsense in both cases. Isn't this constantly coming across and I've said this many times before this is all looking to the public as we're all trying to protect each other this is not this is not this isn't for the people this is they're absolutely people right. protecting each other's jobs behind the scenes that's how it's playing out to me and other people. Well 
Mm, perhaps, but to me, it's playing out. It's 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 the AG that I increasingly feel uncomfortable uh, uncomfortable about. Do you remember we did that? Uh, we've done a whole load of uh, series of interviews on this, haven't we? From the from the get go. Do you remember the one that you you Sam Turton and I did straight after the the judgment of the tribunal itself, the findings of the tribunal, when that actually took place, and I said. The last thing that the government should even consider doing is going to appeal. Now that was, they were still within the 42 days. Um, and ultimately, if there is going to appeal, it be a, an appeal, it can only be on a technicality. Well, I think, do you recall as well, um, quite soon after the original judgment in, in Timwald, it was said, well, actually, we accept the judgment mm -hmm. and we've got a, an issue to face on culture government culture here. Uh, so that was clear. Despite that, we still got these two utterly ridiculous appeals from the Attorney General. Which is costing the public purse, which yeah. is costing yeah. us the, 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 the Paul, I think there's more, to, there's more to this than, than, than cost. Yeah. It's the integrity um, of the Attorney General's office. Why was it? Let's just suppose in for a second that the, the both appeals, but both issues. Subsequently, it was the, the DHSC and AG's department were found innocent of. Even given that that uh, ultimately turns out to be the case. In other words, there are no problems on the dis disclosures in the first appeal, uh, and it's found that uh, that Anna Healy did conduct herself uh, to a high level in, of integrity. If that's found to be the case, even then. Why was it necessary for the AG to have these two appeals in the first place? It just makes no sense. And I've thought quite long and hard about this, and I can only conclude that, frankly, the, the AG's department is not fit for a purpose. It, it ha it, there was no need to go to these appeals. It's done great damage, as you just said, in, in the public mind. What on earth are they up to? But in this instance, the system was challenged successfully, and we've said this many times before, by Rosalind Ranson's people. Um, and it's as if somehow the AGs have found their noses have been pushed out, and how dare anybody challenge them? And you had a situation where, as we ran up to the, the two appeals, the two ministers came out with complete nonsense. Who advised them? What on earth is going on? Now, in the, in the, in the um, judgment of the second appeal, there was one particular phrase that jumped out for me, and it was in, in Deemster One's uh, judgment of the second appeal, that's this ridiculous uh, uh, legal and professional privilege issue, which was dismissed at the get-go. And he said this, the extent to which our system of civil justice depends on the integrity of advocates cannot be overemphasized. Now, I don't think the integrity necessarily of, of uh, Anna Healy is the question here. It's the AG's department themselves for even entering into okay. this. And, and, and furthermore, the AG, remember, the AG's is a crown appointment. To my mind, and I'm sure, to the mind of most reasonable and fair people, it's absolutely essential that the AG's department conducts itself to the very highest standards possible. There is no evidence at all in the way they've conducted themselves here that that's how they've behaved. And, 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 and let me just say this. Um, over my time in politics, um, I, I was always a little bit disconcerted by the degree to which... Um, members of Timwald kowtowed to the view of the Attorney General, as if somehow these were tablets of stone. Proclamations, Proclamations. coming down. Yeah. It was the view of, of, an, of an attorney. Mm -hmm. there is, the problem the, the AG's department has got is there's no challenge and there's no real oversight. A member of, T of Timwald or Keys has oversight in the sense that if they fail, they will lose their seat. And there are all sorts of other checks and balances in existence in, for example, the judicial system itself, because there's an appeal process and it can go up to the Supreme Court. But what is it 
that's fundamentally challenging the AG's department. They, they are overpowerful, they've become arrogant and complacent, and I think this has manifested itself hugely in this particular case. It's a culture. It's That's what we're getting to. Correct. They, they've had a way of doing things, and they've never been challenged. And Suddenly, and let's face it, they went to the wire on this one to desperately not yeah. to be found with their pants down, if you want to use those sort of terms. Mm -hmm. Some, there's a short falling by, by my, my look at it. Something has gone drastically yes. wrong. Mm -hmm. they, I say they've been caught out almost, it feels mm -hmm. like, and they've done everything they can to patch this up and make it go away. But they've made it worse. And in every case, it's got worse. Yeah, because... I'm the audience that have gone to watch this, the crowds are turning up. I mean, the, the first team just said, I've never seen people in this court like this. Mm -hmm. I mean, every seat was taken because there is a national interest. Yeah, but because this goes to the root of everything that we live for on the Isle of Man. Totally we right. believe we've got a trustworthy and a fair way of dealing with things. Mm -hmm. And I feel sick, sick that this is giving a feeling that things aren't right. Well, and I could have been going back a long way, not right as well. I mean, you, who knows what other things may or may not ever come out of this, but there's got to be a culture change, yeah? Yeah, well, and uh, listen, you've, you've captured it brilliantly there, Paul, absolutely brilliantly, because do you remember in the, in the Timwell debate that wasn't allowed, do you remember that? Yes. And do you remember the occasions as well prior to that where, oh, it's sub judice this and sub judice Why didn't the Attorney General's office say, no, it's not, he, it was never issued. The, or denial of the, the, um, that particular process. O all along, they, they, they've been clumsy, but in that debate, post the judgment of, the, of Rosalind Ranson's uh, faulty or in, incorrect improper dismissal, um, it was that very phrase was used that, that it's a, an issue of, of culture. But the, the only thing that came out f at that time was that, oh, there's got to be training. And I, I sort of thought, well, what? Training? This goes right to the top. And it, it, and it went right to the top in terms of, you know, the very senior people in, in central government uh, and DHSC. It also goes right to the top of the AG's department as well. So where's the culture change going to be? Well, didn't they say we'd like to put this behind us and move on? One of those great things like, OK, we've messed up, but let's not go there. Let's just start afresh and we'll, we'll just play better in future. No, because there's got to be, in my humble opinion, an identification of, of how the culture in the AG's department is going to change. It's, it's failing in a number of areas and, and we won't sort of visit those today but one hears of other issues around for example uh, tender documents taking an eternity of time to to be dealt with and so on and so forth but if you go right back to the Wooler report a decade or more ago there were very very significant uh, criticisms of the AG's department then and Steve Wooler as I said in a previous interview has been back this summer to review again what hasn't been done Let's keep our fingers crossed that there's some indication in that report, that review, that fundamental culture change is needed. But we're going to have to wait and see. Well, we have a new AG, of course, which could be a new broom. Um, You're not... No. Uh, well, the, if that new broom was going to happen, wasn't he in a position to cancel the second appeal? If it... If it had the importance in his mind that it should have done, why didn't he just withdraw that appeal and say, could, that's ridiculous? But could he? Or was it DHSC who were technically bringing this? I mean, would it not have been the minister? And I'm talking about the last one with Laura Hughes, but I was going, you know, no, can the, you not stop no, this? The person, now it's, no, the person in question was Anna Healy. She was a member of the AG's department. Yes. Um, and the AG, remember, advises all the departments anyway. So back to this issue of... The AG being able to say, "Well, this is this is a ridiculously uh, weak appeal. I'm not going to let it f go forward." And look at the damage publicly; it's done again. I, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm astonished that this keep, just well, keeps then, bumbling on. Because people are protecting each other here. Let's be honest about it. This is what we keep saying. There's, there's people powerful people who are trying to make this go away and making it worse every time and they don't for some reason they don't see it and we are sitting here as now talking about another unsuccessful appeal by the government against something that clearly could have been just pushed now to one side and get on with the main details of giving this poor woman some money that she well deserves absolutely but there is a duty of care on the part of Timwell here to, to fulfill their duties 
in terms of bringing, I wouldn't say bringing to heel, that's too powerful a statement, but bringing into line what we reasonably and fairly should expect of our IG's department and make it happen. That there, there has been a, a complete lack, a timidity, shall we say. There's been a timidity in, in our political process in Timwald to grasp these issues, which is why I, I encourage the setup of the Constitutional Legal and Justice Committee and how we ended up as a consequence of that with the Minister of Justice. Now, Jane has a, a duty of care here. What is she doing to consider the paucity, the, the, the pathetic, frankly, um, performance of the AG's department in this whole matter? I hope Jane's attitude isn't, oh, let's brush this aside and move on. Timwell shouldn't. This Timwell, you know there's a, there's a Timwell next Tuesday, right? If you look through, there's only one motion brought forward by one uh, member, Jay, uh, Jason Morehouse, over one particular matter. There's been a complete absence of challenge on the part of members. They, they, they've, they are timid and they seem, I don't know, cowed by the whole issue. Well, so, and since it's all over, I suppose maybe you could say that everyone wants to keep their powder dry because it's not all over, is it? There's a January uh, tribunal sitting, isn't there? Well, uh, if, I, if I was a member of the Constitutional League and the Justice Committee now, and I'm not obviously because I'm retired, I'd be following this like a hawk. Mm -hmm. I would hope that Jane's following it like a hawk. I hope the Council of Ministers is following it because it's, it's blooming pathetic. Well, we have a new minister since we were last chatting properly. I mean, the, the, we have now Mr. Collister in charge. So, oh, that's the DHSC. I mean, the focus know, on but, this is but, the but, but, you know, th this is interesting to see, isn't it, that uh, now Laurie Hooper hasn't got any more responsibility for this one. Mm. Uh, he, we did that interview with him. He couldn't ask me anything at all about anything and uh, it was the car crash thing. But he, he, he said on his Twitter about something completely different, about how government's got to be transparent and for the people, that sort of thing. Well, they better start learning <laughs> how to do it, haven't they? Yeah, but, I mean, now we've got Mr. Collister, he, he can, and quite rightly so, say, look, this is all before my time. You know, this is when it, when it finally gets... Done, he can say, oh, okay, I had yes, nothing to do with this, my hands are clean. Right. You see, that's all what right. So, you, you challenged me on that one. Yeah. Remember that Rob's first statement on this was uh, somewhere or other, he published the, the point that uh, there was a vital point to consider. Now, what was that vital point when, in fact, there was nearly laughter in, in the appeal court when both sides said, Well, we don't know we don't why we're here. here. <laughs> so, what, where was that vital point? If Rob, as a minister, is going to say that in public, shouldn't he be sure himself before he says it of what that vital point was? But he's been told this, no doubt, by somebody well, high up that just said, "This is what." You so, know. is that the minister's role, just to simply, you know, repeat what he's told well, to what, say? What was Come it for you, though? I mean, when you were there, was the, pre the pressure like, hey, "This is a piece of paper answering that question. Just no, go and read well, this out." Or do you? <laughs> no, no. The, and, and the officers who worked with me at the time will remember well that I, the last thing I wanted was somebody to place a press Please. release in front of me, and I, 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 and I certainly didn't like them at the last minute because I wanted to cross check and double, double and cross check what I was being asked to say, whether I actually found it was a valid statement, and sometimes I would rewrite it myself completely. You know, Tim, I'm, re I'm there. They, you can see certain ministers reading things out which they clearly haven't written. I mean, they're literally reading somebody else's words out. They shouldn't. Isn't do that the that. state? No. They, 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 well, yes. It, 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 if they if they're over reliance upon their their, their uh, officers. Well, we had a minister saying the buses were all running in TT week, and clearly it appears that wasn't quite the case, and that minister is now no longer in position. Well, these sort of things, and, and and this is where we're getting outside the realms of just this. It's a culture, and I I, I can't tell you how I've never felt this weird about Isle of Man politics that the culture everywhere seems to be about protecting each other in government and not working for the people, which is what I was getting back to earlier. You know. well, I Surely that's what the government is there to look after us, not the other way around. But you, you remember, I've been saying the same thing in, with slightly different f uh, words for years, saying, you know, are, are, is government there for the people or are the people there for government? And it, it's, it's increasingly appearing to be the latter and there really needs to be a shakedown. How can you do that? This is the problem. This is a culture of protectionism illness inside government. Everyone's got rubbing each other's backs, you know, keeping each other away from any legal issues. It's a massive well, change the, of sea, isn't it, on this one to do that? Yeah, well, on the, on the legal side, uh, again, you would expect me to think this constantly or address this in my own mind regularly because it, it, the question you raise is one that 
one struggles to answer. But if you go back in time, there used to be quite a few advocates who were MHKs years ago. And I would have thought that a, a government attorney would um, be very, very careful indeed about what he or she said, bearing in mind there was an immediate audience with competence themselves to say, ah, well, no. Well, of course, now we're in a position where have we got any advocates in keys at all? Uh, Jane's, uh, Jane, oh, uh, Jane's a solicitor. <coughs> yeah. uh, that's it. But but you know I, I've sat in in in, in Timwald and, and I, again I've said this before. You, the members say, well, what does the what does the Attorney General say? And everybody hangs on to his his, his very his every word, and and that's really worrying because as I get as I said mm. before, he also advises the Council of Ministers. So and the department. So there is a, this singularity of advice that goes unchallenged, which is why I said not only should we have the Constitutional Legal and Justice Committee and a Justice Minister of Justice, uh, but we should also have a situation where members have high-grade independent advice from the AG and they haven't got it. So mm. they're just looking to this single point and the single point has come too used, the AG's department, has become too used to not being challenged, corrected or oversight, created the arrogance, which is the culture now at the very heart of government and doing so much damage. You've only got to think about, for example, the, the uh, chaos around Abbotswood, the huge worry about the uh, anaesthetist issue, that's all within the last number of well, and mostly years. when you mention it, go gosh, what have I heard about that recently? It's all been swept away quietly, hasn't it? So far, it's all just mm. in the long grass. Well, look at the posturing that, that occurred over those. Only to find later on, well, there isn't anything to answer. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, and here we are now okay. with this. Does it stop with Alf Cannon then? Is it an Alf Cannon issue that he has to every try and sort this out? Every member of Keys really needs to search their soul over this and they really need to address it. There, there seems to be a tendency to, to, to pursue popular issues of the day. Mm -hmm. as, as Keys members, they've got a duty to deal with this. This is the culture of government and it's in their hands to sort it out. I hear very little or nothing. I just hear silence from almost everybody on this one. There's nothing there saying this is really important. Other than, let's move on, nothing to see here. Come on, that won't do.